Hello, I'm Rachel Geddes. I'm the autism practitioner for the Child Health and Disability Service, covering Inverness and Badenoch and Strass Bay. I moved up to Highland 10 years ago um, and took on this post, obviously with this gorgeous accent I've got. I'm not originally from Highland. Um, and then about five, six years ago, I took on coordinating the training team um, for autism across the whole of Highland, but they only give me one day a week to do that, so it's um, a bit of a challenge. Um, so I'm sort of running about all over the place and there's never enough time. I'm very, very used to standing up in front of a group and talking, but what I absolutely hate is being filmed. So <laughs> this young man's going to have his work cut out for him because I tend to mooch around a lot <laughs> and wave my arms around a lot. So hopefully when I get into my swing, I'll forget that he's there and I'll, I'll feel a bit more relaxed, but um, we'll be okay. So telling your child about diagnosis, right? Okay, so I came across this the other day and I thought, well, that's quite an interesting um, thought, isn't it? So do you know what's harder than telling a child that they're autistic? And it's the not knowing that you are autistic. So for any of us, when something is happening in our lives and we know that something different is, is happening in our minds or in our bodies. It's the not knowing a lot of the time that creates huge anxiety. And that will go for anything that you come across in your life. It's the, you know, once you know what's happening, you can deal with it. If you don't know what's happening, it's really difficult to deal with it. So about 20 years ago, I suddenly became really, really ill and I had a blood pressure of 220 over 180, which if anybody's medical knows that I uh, was probably on the verge of having a stroke. Um, and I was gaining half a stone a week and I felt like death, really. And one of the things they tested me for was the thing that my father had died of. Yeah, so very, very scary. Once I finally got my diagnosis, it was, right, <laughs> that's fine, I can deal with that. Yeah, I know what that is. I can look into it. I can research it. I can get to know what's happening. And for somebody who's on the autistic spectrum, knowing what is happening gives you power. So for anything that's happening in our lives, I always think that knowledge is power. If you know why you feel differently, it helps you to feel a lot more confident. I also now at the sort of, I think I decided about, at about 40, um, when I learnt a lot more about other conditions around autism, I've worked in autism since 1990, but I started to learn a lot about dyspraxia and I thought, you're quite clearly dyspraxic, Rachel. Yeah, so for 40 years, I'd had all these struggles with fine motor control and coordination and you know, I can't catch a ball to save my life, um, walk into things, my handwriting's appalling. And when you look at the diagnostic criteria for dyspraxia, that is me. But I went through the whole of school thinking, you're not good enough, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do the other. And actually, would I have felt better knowing what was happening um, in my own body, in my own mind? So I, I'm a big advocate of kids knowing what is happening. Another really interesting example I had a few years ago was I started working with a mum whose child was having lots and lots of issues. And uh, mum will not mind me telling you this. I, I do have her permission to share this story, obviously not her name. But she'd had lots and lots of mental health problems. I'd gone all through a life with different issues, different problems, different diagnosis. And when I got to know this woman, I thought, you're quite clearly autistic. So I sent her back to a psychiatrist and said, you know, please assess this lady. Um, highly, highly intelligent lady. Um, and she did get a, a diagnosis of autism. And she said it was just so life enhancing because she finally knew why she couldn't do the things that she couldn't do. She had an explanation of why she felt the way that she felt. And to her, that was absolutely life-changing. And she's managed to now figure out, well, that's okay. That I can't, you know, all these things she'd been beating herself up for for years 
of I can't do that, why can't I do that, everybody else can do that. And when she realised that this is the reason why she couldn't do that, it was utterly life enhancing for her. Um, and she's been able to really get to grips with now what is going on in her head, what is feasible for her and what's not feasible for her. Um, and she just feels like she's been given some real power around her own condition and has stopped beating herself up over the things she can and can't do. She now accepts what her own limitations are. So knowing what's happening for you is really important because believe me, your kids know that they're different. Yeah, they know that, that something's going on that's not going on for Johnny who sits next to me in class. They know that, that they're a little bit different and feeling different is really, really scary and can create real anxiety. So knowing what's different about you can be really empowering because then you can figure out, right, okay, this is why I'm different. This is what is different about me. And now I know how to figure out what I can and can't do. And everybody around me can start to accept what I can and can't do. So it lowers anxiety. It gives you ownership of what's happening to you. A few, well, many years ago, actually, one of the first cases I took on when I moved up here, um, the mum that I was working with said to me, I will never accept this diagnosis. And I said, that's absolutely the worst thing <laughs> that you can do. Because if you accept that diagnosis, you learn everything you can possibly learn about that diagnosis. Embrace it, work with it, you know, really empower yourself, empower your child. You will come so much further than denying that diagnosis. And luckily I managed to get her on board. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's about sort of accepting that this is who I am and that's okay. It's okay to be autistic. There is nothing wrong with being autistic. For too many years, it's been seen as a deficit and it is not a deficit. It is a difference. And that's what we really need. The message to be given to our children is there is not anything wrong with them. They are different and it's okay to be different. So we need to focus on what they're good at, not what the struggles are, okay? Because if we focus on what they can do, empower them in what they can do, it's going to increase the confidence. Now, unfortunately, this, this is not photocopied very well, I noticed in your handout. But this is by um, a woman called Temple Grandin. I don't know whether any of you have ever heard of Temple Grandin. She is an American lady who is autistic herself and has written extensively and it, there are numerous films on YouTube and stuff uh, with Temple Grandin speaking. She's, she's extremely, uh, extremely interesting woman. Uh, one of you know, the foremost sort of knowledgeable people on the autistic spectrum. So, so she says there needs to be a lot more emphasis on what the child can do instead of what the child can't do. So move away from that deficit into it's okay, you're different but it's okay to be different. And this is what strengths this potentially can give you. So autism through the years then. So I, I came across this the other day and I thought this is quite an interesting timeline because this is pretty much my life. Okay, so I was born in 72 um, and these statistics start in 75, which is the year I started nursery. Um, so, so I can vaguely remember 1970, <laughs> vaguely. Yeah, I remember 76 more because it was really, really hot yeah, and I had horrific eczema. So I remember the summer of 76, but so in 1975, one in 5,000 people were diagnosed as, as autistic. In 85, we'd got it to two and a half thousand. In 95, it had gone up to one in 500. 2001, one in 250. 2004, one in 66, uh, oh, sorry, 166. 2007, it was one in 150. 2009, one in 110. 2012, one in 88. 2013, one in 50. And the most recent statistic I could find was 2018, because obviously we haven't got them for 2019 yet, is that one child in 59 will be diagnosed as having autism. 
So if I think back about my timeline, in 1990, I started my original training as a learning disability nurse. And at that point in time, the majority of people who were being diagnosed as autistic also had a learning disability. Okay, so those were the classically autistic people with a learning disability and quite complex needs. Okay, that's what we recognised as autism being. That isn't the case. We've learned so much over the last 30 years about what autism really is. And, you know, there's only, I think it's something like 44% of people on the autistic spectrum have a learning disability. The others don't, yeah? So the majority of people on the autistic spectrum do not have a learning disability. They are, um, you know, academically able, sometimes academically very, very able, um, you know, above and beyond what, what I'm ever going to aspire to. Um, so, so it's an interesting statistic because it makes you think that, you know, if you think about your child's primary school, you know, if I think about my child's primary school, there are 100 kids in that school, which means that in probability, there's probably going to be two kids in that primary school who are autistic, yeah? I can tell you there's at least six kids in my kids' primary school who are autistic. So, because I know that primary school very, very well, spend a lot of time there as a parent, not as a professional. Um, I, I know every autistic kid in our village, cause mum's gone, Rachel, could you just? Um, because I live in a small community. So, so knowing that you're not alone, is also a really big thing. I think having what I call a tribe, anything that's happening in your life, if you've got a tribe and know that actually I'm not the only person with this, can also be really, really empowering. I think these statistics are probably not as up to date as they should be because I meet loads and loads of adults who've been misdiagnosed over the years um, and don't have the autistic diagnosis, they have something else. Uh, my friend's dad was actually diagnosed as, as autistic at 64. Okay, so there's been a lot of people missed. If I think back to when I was at school in the 70s, I could tell you who the autistic kids in my class were, yeah? But they didn't have a diagnosis because we didn't have the level of knowledge and understanding that we have now. So have the numbers gone up? Probably not. <laughs> we're just a lot more aware now of how um, different the autistic spectrum is for each and every person. So there is no such thing as an autistic person. Everybody's autism is completely different to the next person's autism, but there will be similarities within those people. And we'll come back to that in a little bit more detail later. So what we need, some messages we need to be given. You're a child first. You are not an autistic child. You are a child with autism. Yeah, I am an adult with dyspraxia. I've not been diagnosed, but I've quite a few of my friends are OTs um, who do the, the dyspraxia <laughs> diagnosis. They're all going, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so do I need a diagnosis? No, I, you know, I don't because I figured out ways that I can do it. So autism is a part of who you are. It's not the whole of who you are. It is a part of who you are. And we need to embrace difference. It's okay to be different. It's okay to, to not be exactly the same as Fred who you sit next to in school. That's all right. But I think we get into... Um, a bit of like a sheep mentality where we're all supposed to be the same. We're all supposed to aspire to be the same and dress the same and look the same and, and follow the same paths. And, you know, we don't, do we? There's, in all of us, there are differences. There might be some things that some people in here w would agree with me that those are good things. There might be other things that I think are good things that you think, Phew, what on earth? No, she's a bit weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking in a meeting yesterday about hair colour because a couple of the ladies had given up dyeing their hair and I was just like, never, <laughs> never, ever, ever. I will be purple till I die. <laughs> yeah. So it's all right to be unique. Who wants to be 
normal. Is there any such thing as normal? There isn't. We're all incredibly different. So when do you tell your child that they're autistic? It's a bit like saying, how long is a piece of string? When do you tell your child that they're autistic? One child might be ready to know at seven. One child might be ready to know at five. One child might be ready to know by 11. It's all dependent on your child and what sort of questions they're starting to ask, what sort of differences are they noticing in themselves? Is that causing anxiety? Could we lower some of that anxiety by saying to them, do you know what? Yes, you are different and that's okay. It's okay to be different and this is why you're different, but this is why this is really important for you to know. So it's dependent on your child's level of maturity, how curious they are at that time, because some kids are incredibly curious and some kids are not. Um, how you think they'll cope if they're in a particularly good patch or a bad patch at the moment. Is this something that we want to wait a little while before we tell them? Or is it something that we think will really help at this, this time? And obviously, what is their level of cognitive ability? Because if the, if the child has a learning disability, then it becomes more tricky to be able to tell them about their diagnosis. It's not impossible, it's just a bit trickier. <clears throat> okay, so tips for talking to your child. Um, you need to choose um, a time when your child's at the most calm and most receptive. Don't blurt it out when they're having um, a bit of a moment um, and, and are very distressed. I often think like it might be, it's quite good to sort of start dropping a few seeds. So things start to germinate and they start to think for themselves. You know, it might be a word you want to use around the house a little bit more. Um, it might be something you need to say, oh, did anybody know that Chris Packham um, is autistic? If that's a, a person that your child particularly looks up to. If you've got a child who's really tech savvy, oh, did you, people reckon that Bill Gates was probably autistic and Steve Jobs. Um, so it, it's sort of dropping little hints sometimes can help. You need to pick a space where there are a few distractions. Obviously it needs to be a calm, quiet situation. Um, you've got rid of the rest of the kids or the dog or the hamster or whatever it might be. And there's just you and that child. What you really need to make sure of is that the person that's doing the talking knows their stuff is confident with it and is positive about it. Because if this is the first message that your child hears, it needs to be a very positive, very proactive, this is absolutely fine, yeah? It's okay to be autistic. This is not a bad thing. It's not a deficit, it's a difference. So the person doing the talking needs to be really clued up I'm really confident that they know what they're talking about. Because for 99.9% .9 of aut the autistic population, they're going to ask you 26,000 questions. So you need to be ready with 26,000 answers. And if you don't an know the answers to them, don't say, I don't know. Just say, I'm going to find that one out for you. <laughs> yeah? Um, so they need to be positive um, to be delivering that information and you need to have done your homework. Return to your child's assessment and things that they may have asked or been asked. So for every child who's got that diagnosis, at some point they've been in a room with a speech and language therapist, with a paediatrician, who's asked them certain questions, they've maybe been here, you know, so it could start with, do you remember when we went to? Yeah, do you remember the lady that played with you? Yeah, did you, you know, what do you think that lady was thinking? Um, what questions did that lady ask you? Yeah, was there anything that popped into your head at that time? You know, how, how is this process going to go through? Uh, make sure that any information you give them 
is right for their age. Don't bamboozle them with science. Um, don't give them too many big words um, and issues that are going to be difficult for them to understand at that time. You know, sometimes we use huge words like neurotypical. Yeah, does it really mean anything? No, it's just a word that we all use, yeah? So you might want to use average <laughs> instead, yeah? Person who's not autistic, yeah? You know, in, as adults, we can use the big terms, but we, we, you know, we don't want to confuse the kids even further. Um, so, we, you know, we need to get it at their level so they completely understand what is being said to them. And you need to think about, obviously, your child. You know your child. Um, better than anybody. So a bit of a game for you to wake you all up in case you snooze in. I want you to turn to the person next to you and preferably not the person you came with. Yeah, so you might have to turn around and you can turn. Yeah, is that all right? Okay, and I want you to have a quick chat about, try and think of three things that you agree on about yourselves and three things that are completely different about yourself. So it could be eye colour, hair colour, um, age group, music, yeah, anything that you agree on or don't agree on. So three of each. Go on, you've got a couple of minutes. Okay, right. Who's willing to speak to me? I can see it tumbleweed going across. Ulrika, I'm pricking on you because I know you. Right. Ulrika and the lady next to you, tell me three things that you found that you've got in common. <laughs> yeah, lovely. Three things that are really different. <laughs> Excellent. So is there any such thing as normal, average? We're all different, aren't we? We're all completely different. Did anybody find anything that was wildly different between them? More similarities than difference, yeah? yeah? That's interesting, we, we yeah? I think maybe we're looking for more similarities. Than okay, <laughs> but then in your little group, two of you wear glasses and one of you doesn't. <laughs> yeah. One of you is blonde, the other two are brown. That's what we found, that <clears throat> there was two in one, two in one, two in one. Uh-huh, yeah? You're obviously a different nationality. <laughs> Not so exactly, because she got the, uh, she married okay. from the Polish. Ah, <laughs> so you found something quite interesting there then. Yeah, there is a similarity. So, so when we get talking to people, we might look at somebody and think, you've got nothing in common with me at all. But actually, when you get talking to them, they might have loads of similarities to you. Or, or you might look at somebody and think, Oh, I think I'll get on with you. Yeah, you look like my sort of person. And then actually when you get to know them, you think, nah, you're really not <laughs> my sort of person. And that's okay. We're all different. So this is a nice little game just to play in your families, to start to think about things that are the same about us, things that are different. So you're just starting to introduce the topic of that we're not all the same. Yeah, so this is just like a nice game for the car or a nice game for the, the dinner table where you're saying, right, oh, right, who in our family's got brown hair? Who in our family has got blue eyes? In my family, we've all got brown eyes, apart from my daughter who's got blue eyes, but she gets them from my mum. Yeah, so it's thinking about what's come down from other members of the family. Who do you look like? Who do you not look like? It's just a game to start to introduce something that's a bit different. And then you can start to think about, okay, well, who in our family has got, is really good at whatever it might be? Who in our family really likes? Yeah, so you're not then just thinking about bodily appearance difference. You're thinking about things that are different within our family. Like my brother-in-law climbs mountains. There's no way my husband's ever going to climb a mountain. <laughs> yeah, it's just not on his agenda. Yeah, so although they're brothers, they think very, very differently about things. But they both ride motorbikes. Yeah, so they've got some differences, some um, similarities. My brother-in-law loves to ski. That, again, that is my husband's idea of a nightmare. Okay, so there are differences and similarities, things that we're good at, things that we're not good at. 
miraculously, both my children are superb badminton players. I'm dyspraxic. <laughs> <laughs> And I've got an alternating squint. So I'm just, uh, yeah, where's the shuttlecock coming? Yes, not a hope. Okay, I can play a very basic game. They've very quickly overtaken me in their level of skill. So it's thinking about what we're good at, what we're not good at. So then, once we've done a game like that, we can then start to, to think about, oh, you know, we played that game and we thought about things that were different, the things that were similar. Let's have a think about problems that, that people in our family might have. Do we have anybody in our family who's, um, who wears glasses? Do we have anybody in our family who uh, wears hearing aids? Oh yeah, granddad, yeah, and when he's not got them in, we've no hope. <laughs> Even when he's got them in, he switches them off. So we've still got no hope. Um, and it's thinking about, okay, well, what else have we got? Does anybody else have any struggles in our family. So my sister's um, really dyslexic, uh, didn't find out until she was 25. My son is also dyslexic. Her kids are not, but it's, it's come to my child, yeah? So we think, okay, there are some similarities between that, um, but that's really good for him because he can see that once Auntie Sarah got her diagnosis, she got lots of things in place. And she's, you know, she's been to university, she's got a degree and, you know, it's okay to be dyslexic. Um, my husband's as blind as a bat. Um, I'm slightly blind, but not as blind as him. <laughs> yeah, he's literally like this. <laughs> he takes his glasses off. And it's thinking about, you know, as any, you know I'm, I'm mathematic. I've got really bad hay fever. Um, what, what else? Um, yeah, I'm a, yeah, a bit blind but all right, um, definitely more eccentric than my husband. He's quite sensible in comparison. Um, and it's sort of thinking about, right, how, who do we know? Who do we know that's got something different, that's, that's something that they need some help with? Yeah, and starting to identify people that we know that need a little bit of extra help because of something that's different about them. So you're starting to introduce the fact that actually being different is okay, it's not a problem, because for everything, that there's things that we can do to help that person. So you're starting to just plant those seeds of, of difference. Um, and then thinking about people in your family, your school, community, who've maybe got more significant needs. Um, you know, do you know somebody who's a wheelchair user? Do you know somebody who's profoundly deaf? So in my kids' school, um, I say there's at least half a dozen of them with autism. There's probably about 10 of them with dyslexia. Um, there's a couple with dyspraxia. There's a kid with cerebral palsy who walks with a frame. There's a kid with a very new, uh, rare um, genetic disorder who uses a wheelchair. And it's sort of introducing, you know, well, it's okay to be different. Everybody is slightly different. And that's okay. We've all got things that we might be really, really good at, but we've all got things that might be a bit of a struggle. So you're just starting to introduce concepts of difference and similarity and making it just part of normal conversation. We can start to use your child's interests. So if your child's got a specialist interest, work with that interest. Um, lots of people call these things obsessions. I call them passions, yeah, because it's good to be passionate about something. Yeah, if I had a hobby, people would say I was passionate about it. If I had autism and had a hobby, they'd say I were obsessed with it. Well, I'm sorry, but it's okay to be passionate about something. Um, so say, for instance, your child's got a passion about dinosaurs. Yeah, so you could look at all of the different dinosaurs. What was he really good at? What were his struggles? What were his strengths? How did he work differently to him? Yeah, what, what were the things? And, and anything, you know, they, they might be into trains. Yeah, so why is that train different to that train? What are his strengths? What are his struggles? What can he do that he can't do? Anything that is within your child's level of interest can be really, really helpful. You could talk about um, characters in a favorite film, TV program. So if your child's into what's popular nowadays, my kids have gone a bit past. 
Marvel. Uh, yes, yeah, so you could, you know, you could talk about Thor and you could talk about Iron Man and you could talk about, oh, Doctor Strange. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, I've got to go and see this film at weekends. <laughs> so, so, yes, so thinking about, okay, so these are people you really like. Let's think about them. What, what have they got? What are their, their issues? And starting to just introduce that it's okay to be different. It's not a deficit. It's a difference. I hate that word. Yeah. Um, is anybody sort of going back a few years? We used to have the triad of impairments. Yeah? Anybody come across that term when they've been researching? It's just lovely, isn't it? Triad of impairments. Yeah. <laughs> these, these things could give your children the most incredible skill. <laughs> yeah. So I don't, I don't work with a deficit model or an impairment model or a, it's a, it's a difference. Okay? Technology can be really interesting um, for, for a lot of kids on the spectrum. Well, all kids nowadays are massively into technology. Um, you know, we grew up without mobile phones and computers. And, I, you know, I can remember the first computer coming into my house. I was 26 and it sat in the corner of my dining room because I didn't dare switch it on. <laughs> and it sat there for probably about six months before I plucked up the courage. <laughs> it was my father-in-law's cast off. <laughs> yeah. Whereas the young people in the room are probably rolling their eyes at me now thinking, "Woo, that's a bit weird. I'm doing a master's degree at the moment. And do you know how easy it is to study in 2019? Yeah, it's ridiculously easy. Like you, you download an article and then within that article you can click on the other links to it and it brings them up. I used to have to sit at library for hours on end trawling through paper and books. It's a different world that we live in, okay? But it's a world that our children tend to know quite well so using technology can be quite interesting. So I'm going to give you one of my little um, analogies to work with because this might work for your child. Right, what's that? It's an iPhone, okay. What can I do with an iPhone? Everything, <laughs> yeah. Go on then, give me a list of what I can do with that iPhone. Yep, yep, yep. Make a call, yes, it's a phone. <laughs> yeah, everybody starts with all the other things that you can do with it, but yes, it's a, it is a phone. I can call people. What else can I do with it? I can place an online order, yeah. Email. Yep. Facebook. Yep. Make a videos. Make a what? Videos. Video. Oh, yes. Yeah, I could, yeah. Old music videos. Yes. You can, you can listen to music. I could. You can listen to iPods. Yes. I could. You can watch TV. I can. But you don't do any of those things. I do. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do. <laughs> no, I, lo I love iPhone. I have embraced technology more as I've got older. So yes, I do all of those things on my iPhone. Right. I've got Apple Music. Has anybody else got Apple Music? Right. You're nodding at me. Right. Okay. So on Apple Music, who've you got? Oh, Go on then. Give me a few examples. Got compilations of, of lots of things. Go on then. What's, what, what genre are you into? Dance music. Oh? Da ooh. <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's not my cup of tea. <laughs> Anything else? Um, I don't know. Uh, I've got lots of kids' stuff on there as well. Right. Um, Sunbox. Okay. Sunbox compilations. Um, kids' radio. Um, uh huh. Um, okay, none of those are on mine. <laughs> none of them. Okay, because my kids are older. Yeah, so I've got Billie Eilish on mine. Has anybody ever heard of her? Oh, I was made to listen to it all the way to uh, Yorkshire. <laughs> oh, dear. Not my cup of tea at all. Okay, so although we're both iPhones, yeah, so if we think about an iPhone as being the neurotypical average <laughs> person, yeah, but there were there differences between them. So what, what shopping do you do? Yeah, I don't, I don't do that on my iPhone because my eyesight's not good enough okay. to see that on my phone. I do that on my iPad. <laughs> yeah. 
but your eyesight might be better than mine, so you might manage it on your iPhone. My friend came round the other week, and she was tapping away on her phone trying to show me something, and I was like, oh, you've got really big, bold scripts on there. How do I change mine to be able to do that? We're both iPhones, but we're different, okay? So it's thinking about differences and similarities. Okay, who's not got an iPhone? Right, Donna, what you got? Oh, sorry, I'm moving in front of that camera. <laughs> right, I'm, rend I'm lending Donna's Samsung. Right, what can I do with that? Exactly the same as what I can do with that, okay? What, though, would happen if I tried to download Apple Music onto that? It won't work. It won't work. What about if I try to download Apple Pay onto that? What if I da try to download an iPhone-specific app onto that? It wouldn't work. Yeah? Yeah, you can't access it. It might crash, but it wouldn't work. Okay? So if we think of an Android phone as being somebody with autism, they can do exactly the same as what I can do as an iPhone, but they do it differently. Their processing systems, the way that their brains work is different. It's not wrong, it's not bad, it's not deficit, it's different. Okay, so the things, that the way I process information is different to the way that the person with autism processes information. Oh, it's buzzing in me, I'm done. <laughs> I thought it was going to start ringing then. <laughs> okay, it's different. Why then does the Android have more struggles than the iPhone? Okay, if you think back to those, one, those statistics, one in 59 people are diagnosed with autism. That means the other 58 people are iPhones. So you're surrounded by people who are on a different operating system to you. You're on a different processing system to you. So therefore, they're all communicating and passing information in a way that they all understand. But you're processing differently. So therefore, everything you're then trying to decipher is in their language, not yours. Yeah, so if you, if you think about having come from a different country and it's in a different language, you're constantly having to think and process and figure out what that person said. And that's exhausting. So when you're constantly having to accommodate to, to iPhone world, your anxiety is going to go up. Because you're constantly having to decipher what somebody said. And that's really, really tiring, okay? So what we can do then is figure out what bits are you really struggling with in, in the processing of this information and how can we load you with the appropriate apps in order that you can function, okay? Which will be different to how I function, but actually I can help you. I, I talk a lot about underpinning. Um, any builders in the room? No, I come from Doncaster, which is a huge mining community. Um, and um, so lots and lots of pits, lots and lots of underground tunnels and lots of subsidence. So my first ever house was a, a terraced house where the kitchen was an offshoot from the house and it started sinking into the ground. Yeah, so I've got huge cracks in my walls and, and the, the back end of the house was literally sinking into the concrete of the background. So I needed underpinning. I needed firmer foundations. And when I've got firmer foundations, I can start to be able to cope. If my foundations are not strong enough, then I will have huge anxiety, which I did when my house was falling into the ground. <laughs> yeah, But once I'd been underpinned, the anxiety lowers. So if we think about this into the processing systems of people on the autistic spectrum, if we can help them by underpinning them 
and helping them to understand the things that they don't understand, then we can make life much easier. So to give you an example of that, a child in a primary school will go into primary school and they will figure out what the social rules are just by being in the class and by being in the playground and playing with older children. They will figure out what's okay and what's not okay, what you can get away with, what you can't get away with. And then they will adapt their behavior accordingly. The child on the autistic spectrum uh, part of the diagnosis, so they'll pick up some of it, but not all of it. They might misinterpret what you can and can't do. That then creates anxiety because I don't know what I'm doing. And then that can lead to some behavioral issues because it's all very confusing. Okay. However, if we then go back to that issue and say, do you know what? That's okay. That didn't go quite right for you. Let's write a social story about that to think about what we're going to do differently if that happens in the future. And this is why people do what they do. Yeah. You've loaded a different app. You've done some underpinning and then they feel safer going into that environment. Say, for instance, you've got a child with a sensory problem who, again, which is part of the diagnostic criteria. If they hate really loud noises or big crowds, it's thinking about how am I going to help them to deal with that particular issue? And again, you're putting things in place to alleviate some of that anxiety. So if, you know, nobody in their right mind would want to be in Tesco's on a Saturday afternoon. So it's thinking about when would I go at a different time? When will be manageable? Do I even need to go to Tesco's? Could I do an online order? Yeah, you, <laughs> yeah. I don't need to set a foot in the place, really, do I? Um, so actually, if that is something that is massively overwhelming for me or my child and leads to great anxiety for my child, is it something I need to do? If I do, I'll figure out a way around it to make it easier. If I don't, I'll just shelve it. Okay, because I don't need to know. So, so using technology as an analogy works for some kids. Boys particularly tend to like that one. You can use Xbox and PS4 or, or wh whatever sort of gadgets that they're into. It could be an iPad versus a something else technological. <laughs> I should use technology as my analogy because I've seen this. I'm, I'm very untechnical. Okay. The other one that um, I've been starting to think about just recently is a Lego analogy. So I'm just going to have to move this table. So bear with me a minute um, so I can show you this one. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. <laughs> so loads of kids like Lego. It's probably something that you've got in your houses, majority of you. Um, and it's thinking about explaining autism in a different way. Okay, so, so if we think about a neurotypical person, they're a pretty average square white brick. Okay, but there are differences. Okay, so I've got some even flatter ones. I've got some nice uh, triangular ones that's only got two things in it and one on the top. So although we're all sort of coming out of the same bowl and we're all the same colour and we're all Lego, we are all slightly different, okay? If you're good with Lego, you might want to build a white person. Um, obviously, I'm not going to attempt to build a person in Lego with all of you lot watching me, <laughs> <laughs> okay? So for today, we'll be having a wall, <laughs> okay? So I've heard it starting to think about, OK, if you have autism, you have got um, differences in four areas of functioning. So the four areas of functioning where the differences are, I have got you a really good handout on this that gives you loads of examples, but I'm not giving it to you yet because then you'll know what I'm going to say and then it'll not be anywhere near as interesting. Okay, but don't worry, you don't have to take tons of notes. I've, I've wrote them all down for you and I've got the iPhone one for you as well. Okay, so, so I've got a white wall uh, because we're a child first. I'm a child first. I am not an autistic child. I'm a, I am a child with autism. The four different categories of autism are social communication, 
Okay, so for this process, social communication is going to be blue. Okay, so I'm then going to start adding blue bricks to my wall because if I'm autistic, I've got a social communication difference. Okay, so I'm starting to add, it becomes a much more interesting model. It's much less boring. I can't get it to actually click on, but there you go. Right, here we go. <laughs> right, okay. Now, depending on the level of my social interaction issues, I might have tons of blue bricks in that wall. So say, for instance, I'm a non-verbal child on the autistic spectrum. I've, I've got quite a significant issue with my social communication. So I'm going to put tons and tons of blue bricks into my wall. Yeah, does that make sense? Okay. If I'm a very verbal child, um, but I don't understand um, social rules, so I get things wrong in the playgrounds. Uh, if I'm a child that never, ever stops talking um, over and above what is socially appropriate, I've still got some social communication differences. Um, I know one of the kids in school with, with my kids, uh, his mum's a friend of mine, um, he has got absolutely no filter whatsoever. So if he thinks it, he says it. Okay, so he says some, some quite inappropriate stuff. So yeah, he's not meaning to be, you know, he's not meaning to be rude. He's not meaning to be nasty. He just says it and he sees it. So we might see it and think it, but we wouldn't say it. He's going to say it. Okay, so I might see somebody who's had a different haircut and think, whoa, that's not so good, is it? <laughs> yeah, but I've got the filter. I've got the ability to not say that. Okay, he would just say to you, dodgy haircut. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was said to me a few years ago. He went, have you got a baby in that tummy, Rach? I went, nah, I'm just fat, Craig. <laughs> and he was like, all right. Because <laughs> yeah. it, it wasn't meaning to, to be, you know, to everybody else, everybody else in the room went, <gasps> and I was just like, it's fine. He's not doing it to be rude. He's just saying, what he sees, yeah? So depending on how many communication issues you've got, you might have different levels of blue brick, okay? You're gonna have some interaction difficulties. You're gonna struggle with things like, and again, I've, I've wrote you a big list of examples. Um, you're gonna struggle with things like eye contact, reading facial expressions, understanding what gesture means, understanding sarcasm, humour are probably going to be things that you struggle with. Yeah, so you're going to have some green bricks in there. So you're making this wall much more interesting than it was to start with because you've got some differences to the plain neurotypical white wall. You've got differences in there and that's okay because it's okay to be different, okay? Depending on the level, of your need within those will depend how many of the, the green bricks you've got, okay? You're also gonna have issues with needing a routine, having things quite structured, knowing what's happening in your life, okay? And again, I've got your big list of examples because some will apply to your child and some won't. Yeah, so it's quite an interesting thing is to sort of get a list down of, you know, of what you know your child struggles with and some things that you know they definitely don't struggle with and just sort of saying oh does that apply to you or does that not apply to you you don't have a problem with that do you and there might be things that you think are a problem that they don't think are a problem yeah because it's all to do so we're adding more bricks from the gray bowl into the diagnosis and that's okay some of them are different shapes as well so it's it's turning into a really interesting wall full of differences. But remember, difference is not bad. Difference is difference. It's okay to be different, okay? The fourth diagnostic criteria, which came into what used to be the triad of impairments, <laughs> changed, the diagnostic criteria changed in 2013, um, and it now also includes sensory processing difficulties. Now, we always knew 
that people with autism had sensory processing difficulties. I could have told you that from 1990. But we're much more aware of it now. It's, it's you know, sort of a bigger topic, a hotter topic, something that we're um, wanting to sort of give more input to children with because we realise how much that really impacts on that child's difference. So as part of my master's, I was asked the question, what's changed since you came into practice? So I chose to take the sensory processing elements that was added to the diagnostic criteria and look at how that had changed over the years and what we can do to help that child with a sensory processing problem um, in all aspects of their life. Because a lot of anxiety is caused by sensory processing. Uh, difficulties so so sensory processing is yellow okay so we're starting to add some sensory processing difficulties to our model okay so then we're adding in um, some yellow so your child might have only a tiny bit of sensory processing problem so you might just add a tiny brick um, but the other children can have real significant difficulties with sensory processing. The resource that I wrote for my masters is on our website. Um, so it's a booklet called Frazzled Fred's Guide to the Sensory World of Autism. Um, it's dead easy to read because as you'll have noticed today, I don't talk in big highfalutin words. So I write in the same way, so it is really, really easy to read. Um, because I, I don't like complicated stuff. So I'm breaking this model all over the place here because I'm conscious there's a camera on me. Okay, so yellow, I've added in sensory processing. Okay, uh, so yeah, have I got all my colours now? Right, okay, so this is the person with autism. It's a much more interesting wall than the boring white wall and it's a bit more complex, but that's all right, okay, because it's okay to be different. There are also some other things that are linked to autism that you might want to add in, okay? So lots of kids on the autistic spectrum have what we call anxiety issues, right? I have a bit of a bugbear. I have lots of bugbears, but one of my bugbears is people saying that people with autism have got mental health issues. People with autism do not have mental health issues they have autism. Autism can create some anxiety and processing difficulties due to the autism. Yeah, it's not a mental health problem. It is autism. Okay, some kids, yeah, do end up with what we call a dual diagnosis where yes, they have got a mental health problem as well as but for the majority of people with autism, it is their autism that creates the anxiety. So all of these four facets, if we're not underpinning and we're not meeting the needs of that person, might lead to anxiety. Okay, so then we would add in some anxiety bricks. Okay, and I've deliberately done them red because it's like a, a danger. Yeah, because anxiety is a horrible thing to deal with. Okay. And that anxiety will look different for each different person. So you're never going to have a wall that's the same as the next wall because your child might have lots of blue bricks, but your child might have not so many blue bricks, but lots of green bricks. Your child might have lots of yellow bricks but your child might not, yeah? So everybody is different. There's this, um, and I'll say, I think it was Temple Grandin that said this as well. If you've met somebody with autism, you've met somebody with autism. Yeah, you've met one person with autism because autism is different for every single child and adult, obviously, because it carries on into adulthood, okay? We also, um, we have, um, some other issues with autism, that autism sometimes comes along with other problems, um, differences. So a lot of children on the autistic spectrum also have ADHD. Yeah, so ADHD is a totally separate condition, but there are a huge amount of correlations between the two conditions. 
my master's bit at the moment is looking at that. So watch this space. There will be a presentation on ADHD, autism and anxiety coming up to a place near you later this year. <laughs> Can I just do a bit of a <laughs> yeah, selling? Yeah. So we're running a pilot at the moment. and It's going very well. OK, <laughs> so so a different condition might then come with a completely different brick because it's a completely different condition yeah so we're marking that out as being something completely different okay but there are lots of colorations so learning disability um myers erlen um fragile x fetal alcohol syndrome yeah all have links um to autism so we're adding something else in there but what it's also really you know we've got this really funky wall now that's quite a an exciting wall if you've got any skill over and above mine, which clearly you're going to have, you could have a really, you could make a house. Each wall could be a different colour. The roof could be a different colour. You could make a person. You could make a, um, a unicorn. Yeah, whatever is meaningful to your child, you could make out of the different coloured bricks. And as we're doing that, because we're doing a play activity, and a play activity is quite fun, when we're playing, we are also tend to be side to side to the child rather than face on to the child. And we're just sort of saying, oh, is that something that you find a bit of a struggle? Do you? All oh, right, well, we'll add. Yeah, let's, we, we need an extra green brick for that. Then where are you going to put your green brick? Okay, and then it might be something that sits up on a shelf and you might go back to it six months later and say, do you know what? You've done brilliant with so-and-so. I think we're going to take that one off. Yeah, because we've done the underpinning on that one and actually you're great with that now. So although it's still there, you're managing it really, really well. And then for any Lego fans, you can also have things um, that are completely different to a, to a brick. And this might be something that's absolutely unique about you, something that you're absolutely fantastic at, something that you absolutely thrive at. Um, I used to work with a kid who knew everything there was to know about flight patterns of aircraft, yeah, about aircraft carriers and about naval warships. His knowledge <laughs> would exceed mine every single time, yeah. So it's adding something that's different to say, right, you've got this unique thing about you. Pretty much nobody is able to do that as well as you do it. So that's a unique thing for you. I used to, when I was at college, uh, when I first left school at 16, um, I met a lad uh, called Stephen there. It, it always sticks in my mind because you could tell him what your date of birth was and he would tell you what was number one in the charts and he was never wrong ever <laughs> yeah. so it's amazing grace if anybody's interested <laughs> but it's, it's, you know this and this is the days before google <laughs> yeah so we'd you'd literally got a book and memorized the entire book and it was never wrong so so it's thinking about yeah you might be able to do something like that you might be a fantastic drawer you might be a fantastic guitar player you might be brilliant at badminton Whatever it is, it's different for you. So there are lots of different ways that we can explain to children what's going on about them, what is the difference. There are a couple of sort of tried and tested methods. Um, so we've got a couple of packages that education can do with your child within school. Um, so there's one called I Am Special and there is one called The Big A. Um, and they help a child to work through a workbook to learn about different similarity, um, additional needs and what autism means to them. And they start to then pick apart, well, what does autism mean to me? If you feel that your child is at the point where they're needing some description um, about their, their difference, then that is something that you can request um, through education. So they're, they're both pretty good resources. Um, one I found last week, which I really, really like, um, it's on my desk, I'll nip up and get it when we're finished, is a book called My Autism Book uh, by a lady called Gloria Duravilla. Um, that's quite a good one. The, there's one in our library um, that says all cats have autism. If you've got a kid who's really into cats, 
it's quite a fun book to read. <laughs> so it's different for, for each person, but it's quite funny. I quite like it. Um, and then there's another great resource called the ASD and Me Picture Book by Joel Shull. Joel Shull is an American psychologist who writes tons of stuff about autism. Very, very easy to understand um, and, and work with. And, and his books are great. Again, our lovely Alison, who manages the library, um, has got all those resources in the library. So there are tons of stuff that you can... Uh huh. Yeah. The the other guy I really really love is this guy. I don't know anybody. Oh, sorry. Um, has anybody ever read these books? Uh, this I get. He's an American psychologist as well, called Bill Nassen. His stuff is really really easy to read. Really simple, really positive, really proactive. If anybody's on Facebook, there is a Facebook page called the Autism Discussion Page. Um, that's his page. Um, again, there's a little snippet every day that just aids your understanding. Because if you are, you know, a parent of a child with autism, you do need to embrace it. You do need to learn as much as you can feasibly learn about it because that will be the wet best way that you can support your child. And then you can start drip feeding um, little snippets of information to your child. Did you know that? Yeah. Or, or you know, sat watching Country File on a Saturday night. Oh, Chris Packham's got Asperger's syndrome, I'm saying. Yeah, incredible guy. Did anybody watch his documentary? It's fantastic. If you didn't, try and get it on iPlayer. It's really, really good. He talks about his journey and about his diagnosis. It's really interesting. There are tons of famous people. The auto oh, yeah, I've never watched that one, but apparently that's very good. So, but it's sort of fine. Yeah, it's finding somebody that your child might relate to uh, and, and sort of giving a positive role model. Do you know what? It's okay to be different. It's okay to have this difference. This is going to help you, um, you know, m maybe be able to focus on things. You know, Microsoft actively recruits people on the autistic spectrum because of their ability to look at finite detail, which we just don't have as neurotypical people. So it's thinking about the positives. It's thinking proactively. It's giving a message that's really clear, but really nurturing. Because the worst thing you can do is the, oh, how dreadful your child's got autism, yeah? It's a difference, not a deficit. Yes, I'm quite sure that your children are struggling with some stuff, but they're struggling because they live in a neurotypical world, yeah? And it's thinking about, right, okay, how can we load a different app, put a different colour in the wall? Yeah, how do we balance out what the issues are and how we can work that differently? Okay, and I'm going to stop talking now. Okay, we're going to grab a cup of coffee because I don't know about you, but I'm a bit desperate. Um, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions uh, that you've got. And if I don't know, I'll come back to you. <laughs> so, all right. Thank you. Thank you.